We'll start in about one minute, everybody, at the top of the, at the half of the hour, which the clock just turned over. So um, it is 12.30. Um, Bill Erickson is going to be presenting uh, a program called I'll Have What Mark's Having. Uh, Mark sounds great. Um, I'm Kate Coleman. I'm from the Missouri Evergreen Consortium, and I will be moderating, and I'll be in the background making sure that everything is going well. Uh, before we jump in, I do want to thank our sponsors, Equinox as our platform sponsor, ECDI as our captioning sponsor, which I will be putting the link in the chat in a minute, and then Kipu, uh, which is, oh, the Hackfest sponsor, but that's for tomorrow, or Thursday, actually. So, um, Bill, I'm assuming I need to screen that you can screen share. Let's give it a shot. Okay. If if you're ready, if now's the time. I am ready. Okay. Let's see. All right. Do you see a slide looking thing? Yep. Looks great. Great. Right. Okay. I will take it and run with it. Um, Actually, let me get the chat up real quick. I'd like to see that in the background, if I can find it. Reactions, maybe I don't see it. Uh, all right, anyway. Um, so, hi, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for joining me here. Um, uh, I'm super excited about the, um, North Carolina contingent on the uh, calls today uh, at the whole conference has been really exciting. I've lived in North Carolina for a while in three different counties and none of them are part of NC Cardinal, uh, which is terrible. So I need to keep moving until I land at a good one. Uh, but I'm coming to you from Greensboro today. Um, and I'm talking about a project that we did at King County Library System. I've been meaning to um, present on this for several years really. Um, but other you know, things uh, come into play. And so I thought it'd be a good time to take advantage of some of these shorter sessions that we're offering this time to do a quick one on a project uh, that I coded and worked with the uh, KCLS staff on. So I, my slides are on my GitHub there if anyone's interested. Um, I also have a demo server running that I set up for a session that I did yesterday. It's also running the code I'm discussing today. Anyone's welcome to join in and poke around on there and you know do your worst. Um, it just it, just beware that of course if 50 people jump on at once, it's probably not going to be super happy. Um, but it's there if anyone wants to use it, and I'll leave it there for a while. So um, a while back, so several years ago, we were going through a process at King County to try to find ways to make parts of the cataloging workflow a little bit more efficient. There were issues with finding records, collecting records for modification, how to batch modify those records, different, various different criteria. Um, from that sprung a lot of different work that we did. Um, part of that affected or impacted some of the um, staff catalog uh, functionality that's there now uh, in the Angular catalog. Um, some of that led to, um, or informed anyway, some of the work we did with adopting Elasticsearch to uh, run our catalog in King County. And then uh, another part of it informed the work that I'm going to talk about today. There were a lot of different ways in which staff wanted to modify MARC records. And um, as we were working through various ways, I would be trying to figure them out myself, trying to help, trying to help document what we can do. And I found myself bumping up against some edges that I just couldn't quite figure out how to make things work. Um, and that probably says more about me and the software, but um, what I ended up doing with that is I sort of kind of stopped and decided to take stock of what was there and just kind of asked myself the question of what I would do if I were a cataloger, what kind of interface would I want to see and how would it make sense to me? Um, which is not always ideal. Um, software developer, we don't always have the best sense of what an interface should be. Uh, but you know, it was a relatively well-contained problem that we were trying to solve, so I thought I would just give it a shot. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. And um, so I'm going to pop over to my local Evergreen VM and um, do some examples. Uh, 
Uh, and then after I do some kind of uh, examples of what I'm talking about, I'll also mention a few ways in which our staff have been using the interface. So the uh, basics here are from the record bucket interface, I've already built a bucket. You have access to the existing mark batch edit interface. And then next to that, I just put a button <laughs> creatively called batch edit alternate. And this is what brings up the interface uh, that we have coded and developed at King County. Um, and you'll notice that it's really fairly basic in its operation. Uh, that doesn't mean it's easy to use. Uh, this is uh, arguably something that is something maybe a little more attuned to sort of power users or more advanced usage because it is based on regular expressions, um, which take a little bit of practice to get used to. And I still always approach them with caution. <laughs> um, but I was going to go through a couple of simple examples of what we build and then um, kind of take it from there and, of course, uh, take questions. And I'm happy to be interrupted with uh, questions along the way. So at its basic, uh, the um, the way the interface works is it, it it works on buckets. Right now, that's all it does. It could be expanded out to work on lists of or other types of lists or record IDs and things like that. But uh, our staff were accustomed to using buckets, so we just built it from that. And um, you essentially just define a search parameter and a replacement parameter, and uh, these both operate as regular expressions. So you can do very, very basic things like I want to replace a string with another string. And then you can do much, much more complicated things where you are finding, you know, doing very detailed expressions to find very pre precise things and then going in and changing them. And in some cases, retaining parts of what you matched on before. So just for a nice, simple example, I'm going to double click this first record. I don't have any input in the form yet, so there's nothing to display here. But if I see the before changes tab, it's going to show the original record in the textual mark breaker format. And um, just as a very simple example, I'm just going to pick a row here, compact disks. And I'm going to put this up here into my search box. Now, if you're used to regular expressions, you'll know that there are certain characters that are special. And so we have to escape those. So dollar sign is a special character in regular expressions. So just put a slash in front of that, as are parentheses. So I have my search expression here. Now, if I wanted to replace this with something else, I just want to say I don't want compact disks. I want CDs. Now, if I double click on the row, now we have a new bit of data here. So what has happened is the um, interface here has sent off the expression I just compiled to an API, a new API in Evergreen, which compares, which applies the regular expressions to the mark breaker format of the bib record, compiles a diff using a, um, a Perl module. I think it's just called text diff. And then it sends that back and then we display it here. So at this point, no data has been modified in the Evergreen database. It's simply done a dry run operation to show you what would happen if you were to apply the change uh, as, as coded. So um, this is a little bit different for a lot of catalogers and a lot of uh, ILS staff. You may not interact with diff formatting all that often. Those of you in the, all, uh, in the audience who have done coding documentation, anything with a version control system, um, this will seem a little more familiar. Uh, but it, it, for most people, it seems like it's pretty quick to get accustomed to. Essentially, it's just showing you what is going to change in the value, and it's giving you a little bit of contextual information about what's going to change. So we are jumping in here around line nine of my record. And then we have a line with a little minus sign in front that says we're getting rid of this whole line. And then we have a line with a plus sign in front, which says we're adding this entire line. And the other lines are untouched. Again, they're just there to give you a sense of where you are in the record. Um, and that, that value can change. You can add more or less context uh, with a simple code change. But three seems to give a pretty good sense of where you are. And of course, mark is structured in a way that generally, if you know the tag, you have a good sense of where you are in the record. 
So in this case, we are replacing compact disks, the whole line with CDs. Now, if I were to close this out um, and I want to apply this rule, if I apply the rule now, it's going to apply it to every record in the bucket. Um, so I'll just go ahead and run that because this is just test data. I can, I can do whatever I want in here. So I'm going to apply the rule to the bib records. It's going to let me know that it, it's going to apply change to this many records. And if I do it, it cannot be undone. There is no undo operation in the interface. There are only warnings and upfront data. So if you hit confirm, then it's going to go ahead and apply the process. I get my batch update progress bar, and then the progress bar ends. It lets me know that nine of the records in the bucket uh, were updated. Go back to the record list, and then I get my display here of the icons, which indicate the records which have been modified. So these are all the ones that had compact disks, which have now been changed to CDs. So a couple of other simple ones that I can show. Bill, since you don't mm -hmm. see the chat, do you want me to give you questions as they come up or questions at the end? Oh, questions as they come up is great. And if you know how to tell me how to see the chat, that would be fine too. Well, I don't know other than, <laughs> <laughs> other than you know, I have seen that hosts or presenters can't necessarily, if you're sharing your screen. Okay. Um, we did have a question. Um, so I had a question. Mm -hmm. You use the checkboxes, but um, or there was like the number one checkbox was checked, but the checkboxes don't mean anything. Like you have uh, to apply it to your whole your whole bucket. Yes, it does apply to the whole bucket. I should get rid of the checkboxes. They don't do anything right now. And then um, there are there are questions about when this is going to be available. You know, br more broadly, is the, that happening? Um, Yes. So um, uh, part of the reason I wanted to demo this is because it forces me to get it on Launchpad. So it will be on Launchpad before the end of the week. And Galen asks, are the change sets persisted in the database, i.e. does it maintain a record of the search and replace regex, PS, and who did them? Uh, it, it does. It does not retain the search and replace regular expressions. It does update the editor and edit date on the bib record if it's modified, though. Uh, but that's that's an interesting uh, addition to add. So. And Tiffany asks, how much of core evergreen does this modify? Could you potentially apply this without a lot of disruption elsewhere? Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. So it is a new API entirely. It doesn't modify any of the existing APIs, and it is a new interface entirely where all you have is this new button. And if you don't click this new button, then it's essentially like it's not there. And then Darcy pointed out that you can undo by just reversing the search and replace text boxes. This is true. Okay. The, um, with, with some caveats. Um, it depends on the search and replace you start with. If it is a little, it, you can, you can, it is possible to search and replace something and then to undo it is not quite as simple as reversing them. I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but um, it, I, I have run into those scenarios. So it, it, it's not a simple one-to-one -one necessarily. You have to be careful about that. So for, as an example, I just did compact disc and replace it with CDs. If there were other three, four, nine fields that looked like this, that had other content with them, like if it was A, B, C, Ds or something like that, then you tried to undo it. Um, or maybe that's not, it may be like uh, Z, 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 Z. Again, not realistic, but it would be, it would create complications going uh, back and forth like that. So you have to be very con conscious of what is being replaced. Okay, so um, go ahead and continue for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so some other simple stuff. Um, if I wanted to, I'm just gonna copy another line out of this record here. By the way, when I, uh, something seems to have changed in the, in the latest version of Bootstrap where if I click on a row and then I close it, it wants to scroll down. I don't know why that's happening. That's not part of the interface necessarily. I think that's one of the, other CSS things that have changed. Um, so if I wanted to, 
I don't want 730A with this content in it at all in any records. Uh, essentially just leave the left, the uh, right content blank over here, the replacement value. And then if I do check my diff here, um, oh wait, I gotta reset the form first because I just did a update. So I'm gonna reset the form, put that back in, pull this record back up. So here we have, I have taken a row and deleted it and not replaced it with anything. So it simply just gets rid of that row. So you don't have to apply our placement value. And then the another thing you can do here, and this is a little more interesting. I'm not sure if, if it really gets used in this way very much in the wild, but you could in fact use it as a way to add content as well, or add rows, I should say. So anytime I find, 730 works dot selections. I want to add a, a row after that. I can just capture the value, which is what these parentheses do. If you put them in parentheses, you're saying I want to retain that content so they can use it again later in the replacement. Add a new line and then fill in my replacement content. So I've said, I want to keep the 730, I want to add a new line, and then I want to add a 740 with uh, indicators 1, 1, subfield A, here I am. So here we see the record is unchanged except that it gets a new row here. Okay, so we have a mm -hmm. lot going on in chat. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I wish you could see chat. Um, okay, um, let's do, is there a limit on how many records can be edited at once? The limit is based on the bucket. So it only affects what's in the bucket. Other than that, you decide what goes in the bucket. Okay, for fields with multiple subfields, could you replace info in a single subfield? Yes, absolutely. And I'll show some more complicated examples in a minute. Could you alter it so that the checkboxes of the edited records were the only ones selected if you need to undo the changes or just add those to a new bucket? And Darcy commented that that would be a nice enhancement. I, I am assuming that Darcy uses this. Yes. Yes. Uh, can confirm that Darcy uses this. Um, so we could certainly modify it so that the checkboxes affect the records that are modified. Um, now, undoing it is a, a step beyond. So we would have to retain the original records in some place and then allow you to undo it. Again, totally doable in the code. It just not right now, but yeah, those are two enhancements that could be done. And Jason Booyer said um, it could undo the changes on records that weren't just edited, but were already CDs, for example. This is going back to your original, our original um, undo question. And then Blake said, Blake said, for example, one of the records that you didn't change already had the change. They could be reversed along with the ones that you did change. Yes. That is true. And I, I'm, I'm guessing, Blake, you were describing a scenario where the undo is not one to one in both directions. And then Galen asks, have you ever had to, say, use the auditor table on biblio.record underscore entry to manually reverse a bad batch change? It hasn't come up yet. Um, there's a relatively small number of staff at King County that use the interface, and there is a added permission required to access and you know apply these batch updates so it's not um it's not something that a lot of people use um so no we haven't really had to do that yet okay and that's all for now we have 13 okay. no 11 minutes left <laughs> okay all right yeah then let me let me move ahead um some of the other stuff I have on here. Okay, so yeah, I'll jump to some examples that were provided by our cataloging staff in County um, and special thanks to Libby and Darcy for um, telling me some of the ways that they use the software. And I love it because they're just taking it and running with it. Um, so just one example here, we wanted to remove a sentence that appeared at the end of a 520 uh, summary field in a lot of overdrive audiobook records. So um, this is an example that was provided and Really, we are taking the 520 content, keeping what's already there. If it ends in this phrase, then we drop that phrase off the end and we keep just the stuff in the parentheses. I didn't set up um, manual examples of this, so I'm just walking through slides on these. 
Sometimes uh, authority data needs some manual intervention to fix some things. So here's a case where we have, uh, previously we used KCLS in the authority record linking and now we use DLC. Um, so here's a, an example of where some records were found that had the old version in there. And then we use the search replace to find those uh, and then replace those values. And, um, you know, of course, before this happens, a search for these records is happening in the catalog side in the mark search interface. Those are going into a bucket. So then we know we only have, in this case, 14 records in a bucket that at most are going to be impacted by the um, regular expression search and replace here. Another example of some uh, complicated stuff. So um, 655 and then, um, I mean, it. this is the beauty of regexes. <laughs> I, like, I could barely make sense of this the first time I look at it. I have to think about it for a minute. And then it's like dollar one, that's the first capture, dollar two, that's the second capture. Um, so it, it's, you know, it, it's not something that comes naturally to me necessarily, but with a little bit of practice and effort, it, it makes sense. And then here we have the, uh, the replacement down in the uh, image that shows the diff of how the record was repaired. And then some more, whoops, um, search and replace on only on records that have specific types of headings. So we kind of talked about this already a little bit, but um, one of the things I want to add in addition to the, the questions that have come up here is I want to be able to click a button here so as I said before, when I double click a row, it's sending an API call. Uh, let me clear that real quick so that you can see what's happening behind the scenes for you cattle or uh, programmers. So it's sending this API call out with essentially a parameter to perform a dry run operation. And that's where we get the diff from. I want to add a button that makes that call occur for all the records in the interface and then puts the little icon over here or some kind of icon off to the side to indicate which records will be modified were you to actually apply the change. And then you could go in and only analyze the ones that are going to be modified to make sure they're going to be modified in the way you expect. So I think that would also go a long way toward preventing having to undo a lot of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what I mentioned before, yeah, I need to get it in Launchpad. I'm going to get this in Launchpad this week. Um, there's, apart from what we've talked about already, I think maybe I need to get the uh, the grid workstation setting going uh, so that the SQL bits for that. Um, but I think I've worked out most of the UI bugs. Uh, and then I'll make sure to um, note in the launch pad what we've talked about today as far as enhancements and whether or not we want to try to get any of those in before we do, um, before we merge this in. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. Um, so I'm happy to answer any other questions or if anyone else on the KCLS side has uh, stuff they'd like to add or anything like that. Um, we did have a question that Galen seems to have answered for someone. Um, sorry, non-programmer developer here. When you say it will be on Launchpad, whoops, um, my chat keeps jumping, I'm sorry. Does that mean library systems will be able to grab this code and add it to their evergreen and or will it possibly one day be included in future official version release? So adding it to Launchpad is step one of that process. Yes. Oh, Galen says that was not him that <laughs> answered that question. Um, Bill, I, I do think if you're interested, if you stop sharing your screen, maybe you can see I, the chat. I just found the chat. I, oh, awesome. I was Perfect. blind. <laughs> it's really not that hard to find. It's under one menu. So I kind of have a similar question that Mary had. How hard is it to mm -hmm. learn regular expression? And I wondered if anybody has any, any place we could go to start learning. Well, one thing that's kind of interesting is the um, the uh, batch edit interface that's in Evergreen now does have a link in here to the documentation. 
So these are Perl style regular expressions, which are kind of you know standard. And um, this will walk you through a lot of stuff. I would say that regular expressions can do a ton. And a lot of it to me, honestly, I, I rarely use in my day to day. Uh, but then there's also quite a bit you can do with very simple uh, expressions, depending on the uh, you know depending on the requirements. But there is a lot of documentation out in the wild for regular expressions. There's some that are probably even uh, an, uh, a gentler introduction than what's on the Perl side. The Perl docs are going to be very exhaustive. And since you're in chat now, I am going to be quiet. Okay, thank you. I mean, not, not thank you for being quiet. Thank you for helping. <laughs> so we have a suggestion for regex101.com. Oh, there we go. So this is an interface where you can practice essentially with content and regular expressions. Some other links in the chat. A recommendation for a collection of simple expressions. I think that's kind of a neat idea. Sort of pre, sort of canned regular expressions. Um, to answer Galen's questions, uh, is the regex based replacement happening server side or client side? Uh, asking in part because I wonder about the ease of putting regex-based replacement in the single record mark editor. The uh, replacements are happening server side. And um, let me see if I can answer, even provide a slightly better answer to that question. Um, so the, yeah, the API in question does offer uh, a, a, an option to send simply a bib record ID and a search expression and a replace expression. So it doesn't even have to be in a bucket necessarily that you're working on. Uh, so it would, seems like it'd be pretty straightforward to plug that into the mark edit or some other interface. So question, any need for re-ingest, re-index when you make the batch edits? The um, ingesting and indexing will occur as part of the editing of the bit record. So the, all those triggers will fire automatically when you modify the record. Um, let's see, is there a way to use a CSV to create a record bucket of items? I don't actually remember. I don't know the answer to that. Can you load CSV into the catalog? I don't think you can. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think so, but it's someone else would know better. Um, do other evergreen libraries have the mark expert search option. I use that a lot to populate buckets. Yes, mark expert search is part of uh, standard evergreen. The uh, it, It's a little bit juiced up on the KCLS catalog uh, because of the way we use the Elasticsearch stuff, but the, the basic concepts are all the same. Um, so Galen says, thanks, uh, or creating the uh, a variant that passes in a mark XML blob. Yes, that would, that would be eminently doable to just parse pass in raw mark in case that mark doesn't exist in the database yet. And then some comments about loading CSV of items into item buckets as a proxy for loading, creating buckets from a CSV file, going directly to records. And I'm pushing up against the time so I will take this moment to say thank you all for joining. I appreciate all the questions. Um, and I'm happy to stick around for a few more minutes. I think we have a break if anyone, if any other questions roll in.